about microbes? What if I was to tell you that I'm more microbial than human? That's right. In a way, I'm really trillions of bacteria in the shape of a marine microbiologist. And I'm not the only one. We're all like that. 90% of the cells in our bodies are microbes. And our genomes contain 100 times more microbial genes than human ones. Bacteria help us to digest food, maintain a healthy immune system, even influence our behaviour and development. Without them, we simply couldn't survive. So if this invisible microscopic life is so important for us, consider what it would mean for the marine world that covers three quarters of our planet. There's a hidden world of microbes living in the ocean with a complexity and diversity that rivals all other life on Earth. They include bacteria, viruses, fungi, single-celled protozoans, and even microorganisms known as archaea that are famous for their love of living in extreme environments. In fact, if you weighed all the living organisms in the ocean, 90% of that weight would be from microbial cells. They clean up waste, create most of Earth's oxygen, drive carbon and nutrient cycles, they defend against disease, they can glow in the dark, and they can even help shape clouds. They were the first life on the planet and they continue to live in places where nothing else can, from boiling deep sea volcanoes to glacial lakes under the Antarctic ice sheet. They enable other life to thrive in places where otherwise it would simply not be possible. Without microbes, the world as we know it would not exist. And that's what I think about whenever I go diving and I've studied marine microbes from the tropics to the poles. I did my PhD at James Cook University in Townsville on the doorstep of the Great Barrier Reef because I really wanted to find out about the relationship between coral reef sponges and their resident microbes. Now compared to us, sponges are very elegantly simple creatures and about half the weight of the actual animal is made up of microbes that enable it to survive. In fact, entire coral reef ecosystems rely on diverse communities of microbes to capture and recycle the rare nutrients. And this is what allows them to thrive in what is the equivalent of a marine desert. And that's how I started to discover how sensitive microbes are to changing environmental conditions. They're the first thing to be affected when the environment changes. Now, while the lifespan of animals may be years, many microbes turn over generations in a matter of hours. So if the water gets polluted, or the ocean warms, or carbon emissions make it more acidic, microbes are on the front line. We see responses much more quickly at the microscopic level before we see declines in the broader health of the whole ecosystem which makes microbes excellent indicators, like living early warning signs of a changing environment, for good or for bad. And that led me to work in Antarctica. The New Zealand and US Antarctic programs wanted to see if microbes were a useful indicator of human impacts from their stations at Scott and McMurdo. So in 2000, I went to Antarctica to find out. And that meant going from 30 something degrees in the tropics to minus 30 degrees in the Ross Sea to dive under the ice. Now, diving under the ice was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. We had to drill a hole through three metres of ice. We then needed to use a snow groomer to essentially remove a football field size area of snow off the top to let enough light through, like a giant skylight. Because it's seawater, it doesn't freeze at zero, but at about minus two. So essentially you're diving in an ice slurry and all you can see when you pop out the bottom is what looks like crystals shining from the light through the ice hole. And then there's just incredible biodiversity. Most people would probably assume that not much can live under the ice in Antarctica. But there are sea spiders and meter-long worms and incredible sponge gardens, soft corals, fish. You see the same kinds of animals as you do in reefs in southern Australia. Starfish, sea urchins, kelp. But all of these species are only found in Antarctica. 
In some places, instead of coral reefs, there are reefs made out of shelly tube worms. Amazingly beautiful. Not quite enough to forget how cold you are, but almost. Now after Antarctica, I went back to the Great Barrier Reef, where I worked at the Australian Institute of Marine Science for almost 20 years. During that time, I researched the role of microbes in all different parts of ecosystem health, including whether we could harness these microbes to help coral reefs adapt much faster to climate change. It was actually a fairly logical transition between Antarctica and the Great Barrier Reef. And that's because both of these ecosystems are essentially the fastest changing environments under climate change. And that's also what brought me back to the polar south. My vision for the science program at the Australian Antarctic Division is really for us to answer the challenging existential big picture questions. Questions like how fast is Antarctica responding to climate change? What do changes in the ice sheet mean for sea level rise? What does it mean for us? And how can we manage or mitigate these changes? To find the answers to these truly global issues needs audacious science. Genomic sequencing to understand not only what microbes are there, but what they're doing, when and why. Big data to integrate learnings from chemistry, physics and biology. Collaboration so we all work together to be more than the sum of our parts. And then there's the brand new science platforms like Australia's icebreaker, the RSV Noyena, that will set us up to explore the deep ocean, the ice and the atmosphere for decades to come. And in that really big environmental picture, what I still find most fascinating is that it's the tiny invisible things that can sometimes tell us the most about the future, whether that's on a coral reef or under the Antarctic ice. When you put it all together, it's going to be fine. <laughs>